Hey Somerville, Erica Jones here from Somerville Media Center um, with another segment of the Somerville Journal News Roundup with Julia Taliesin. And we are going to share a few of the upcoming headlines, reflections of some stories that the journal um, has been focusing on and also um, put out some information about ways that you as a community member can potentially um, help shape the, the, the public opinion and Julia will be talking uh, much more on, on all these topics. So Julia, welcome back. Thank you so much, Erica. I love ha to be here. Happy to have you. <laughs> um, a lot going on around around the city um, yes. and you are a one person beast out there getting the information and distributing it as much and as widely as possible. So thank you for, for doing your, <laughs> your job very well. Appreciate it. Um, <laughs> So one of the first things that I think just kind of put out there is the stop and shop, uh, the worker strike. Um, obviously, this is a, a local issue. This is a statewide issue. And on various levels, it's a, it's a national issue. Um, do you want to just talk about what, what's going on out there for folks who also don't know what's happening? Sure, yeah. So we're, I think, on day six of the strike now. Um, so there are still strikers out at the two stores in Somerville. Um, I visited the store on McGrath Highway mm -hmm. yesterday um, where there were at least two dozen people um, some workers, but also a lot of just community members and a lot of allied union members. So people from Teamsters, local labor organizations, etc. Um, there's been a real outpouring of support and solidarity from those other unions. Um, even I think one of the unions were bringing by sandwiches, bringing mm. by Gatorade. Um, you know, there was a passing couple who were like pushing a baby in a carriage who had actually brought donuts. <laughs> you know, not to, not come to shop, but just to kind of feed a lot of solidarity. Things. Yeah. Um, and when I was chatting with the workers, they really said that um, Somerville is respecting the picket line that, you know, they've been turning around and going to other stores. And if they have to get through, it's to go to the pharmacy or something. You know, it's it's not to shop. And um, because of that solidarity from the other unions, deliveries are not being made because a lot of the Teamsters unions um, are the truck drivers who right. drive the produce and the dairy and the meat to these stores. The ripple effect. So yeah. Exactly. So in solidarity with the UFCW workers, they're not delivering. So even if you do decide to cross that picket line, it's more than likely that those stores are, one, going to be pretty empty, mm. and two, they're certainly not going to have fresh ingredients. Um, there have been, I think at the McGrath Highway store, there are no cashiers. Um, the only way to check out is to use the um, automated checkout systems. Sure. The parking lot's very empty. Um, it's it's really, I think on a, I was chatting with the Ward 1 counselor, Matt McLaughlin, and he was there on Sunday. And he tweeted out this picture and he said, normally on a Sunday afternoon, this parking lot would be yeah. packed. There was like two cars. Wow. It's, it's, Somerville has really been showing up wow. or not showing up, I and suppose. What are the asks of, of just kind of like in, in terms sure. of like recapping? Mm -hmm that information as well. Yeah, um, so there's definitely a little bit of, um, I think the, the, the company has been putting out statements about how the negotiations have been going and so have the unions. So from the union perspective, they're fighting for you know, a fair contract, which looks like um, you know, health benefits, it looks like access to time and a half to overtime um, for part-time hires as well as full-time workers. There's also things such as spousal benefits, um, and the company has said that yes, you know, they are limiting um, access to healthcare benefits for spouses. They gave the reason that spouses should be able to seek their own healthcare at their job. Um, they are trying to limit time and a half for part-time employees on holidays and Sundays, um, and they have been and will continue to limit um, overtime like availability or opportunity. Um, but I think one of the biggest things that workers are fighting for has to do with health care. That okay. they're, they're simply, um, it's a little complicated, but I think overall the Stop and Shop is offering a contract with increased health care costs, um, especially for family plans, um, which most, you know, many workers there have families to support, and that's yeah. kind of the, the ask. Right. Um, and I was, I was talking with um, a man named Tony yesterday, and he, was, he had worked there for 15 years. Um, it was his first strike, you know, and he said every three years, you know, every three years the negotiations come up, and he said it's been feeling like they just chip away, like every every three years, it's something else is lost, something else is lost, and I think in his point of view, this time it was just too much. It was right. too much. They couldn't go any lower, and that's why they're they're really putting their foot down 
um, in this negotiation season. Yeah, I think it's being felt, like you were saying, all this ripple effect yeah. here locally mm -hmm. and then also just across the state yes. because there's hundreds of other uh -huh. um, grocery stores yeah. who are also... And I think, um, the Boston Globe has been reporting on this definitely more regionally. Um, so, you know, stores in Nantucket and Quincy and like all sure. over. And um, they, I think they, they quoted, um, I don't really know, but it's like a grocery strike specialist, which who know, who knows was a thing, but <laughs> it is, um, who said that this is the most effective, strong, like um, grocery worker strike ever. Wow. Um, that this is, it's really, um, it's really making a difference. And they also had some research that said, Typically, um, because grocery stores kind of operate on a r relatively narrow profit margin that if even 5% of the people who used to shop there don't come back after this strike is over, if they just continue going to Trader Joe's or Whole Foods or wherever, um, that could be a really long-lasting impact on right. the company. Um, so it, it kind of makes you think that the company is probably motivated to kind of get this. Because you also have shareholders to the company as mm -hmm. well, and they're seeing this impact yeah. on their on their level as well. Yeah. So. so that's kind of where that's at right now. We'll we'll see. Negotiations are ongoing. Okay. They're continuing. They were happening yesterday. I believe they're still happening today. So who knows? You know, it could change. So any we'll follow that story. And yeah. then um, you mentioned just having these interviews. And then will there be a story, or has there been a story yep. to publish? There is a story up online about this. Awesome. Um, a couple of videos. Um, there. They're just powering out there. It's really Great. impressive. Well, thank you for sharing that. And then obviously the links and all that stuff is on the screen. Yep. Um, another thing that had been recently was the city of Somerville and the Alec Foster Foundation um, put out the screening of um, Runnin, yes. which is just another way that the city is obviously trying mm -hmm. to raise awareness of opioid addiction. Yes. Um, a lot of people have been at loss of losing family members here. Um, what was your experience going to the screening and and kind of the the energy of the of the crowd there? It was amazing. Um, so I, I've been following. I mean, how can you not follow this issue? It, it's everywhere. You know, right. it's here, but it's everywhere. Um, but I, I've been looking into it together with my intern Hannah. Um, kind of the impact of the crisis in Somerville, but also as it relates to Tufts University a bit, um, because. There's been some controversy around their um, one of their medical buildings being named after the Sackler family who owns uh, Purdue Pharma, and right. Somerville has joined many of the cities bringing lawsuits against that company right. as well as others. Um, so kind of what that means. Um, yeah. Tufts has recently actually hired an investigator to investigate their own connection to the Sackler family, kind of under all this pressure. Wow. So we've been looking into it from that angle, but this, this screening and this night, it was... Um, it was like community in, in like really the most um, kind of visceral sense. It was packed. The Somerville Theater was packed. It was in like the main theater. Yeah. It was over 250 people, um, all ages, you know, seniors um, with canes all the way to like young kids. I think mm -hmm. um, the school committee chair, Carrie Norman, like brought her kids with her. Yeah. Um, and it was amazing. Um, and it was a pretty short film. It was like 30, 40 minutes. Yep. Um, it was a film by Alex Hogan, who's a journalist at Stat News, which is a um, kind of publication of the Globe, more science and health based. And um, he grew up in Somerville and he really just produced this film. It's horrible, but about about his friends. Like right. he had been going to all these funerals and his producer one day asked him, like, why have you been taking so much time off like for bereavement? And he was like, I mean, I've, lo I've lost like four friends in the past like five years, you know what I mean? And and from there, his editor or his producer was like, wow, like, that's a story. Like, yeah. what's happening in Somerville? And he just produced this incredible film, um, really powerful. Um, he interviewed a lot of the family members, the friends of the people who died, yeah. um, which includes <clears throat> Ryan Harrington, Alex Foster, um, Kevin Sullivan, Sean Curtis, um, you know, their, their sisters and brothers and parents who are so incredible. Um, and the event itself was pr produced, co-sponsored by the Alex Foster Foundation, whose parents, Mike and Maureen, were there, right. um, and the city of Somerville's Health and Human Services Department. So Doug Cress, the director of that department, was mm -hmm. there. Um, but after, there was the film, but there was also a panel, which was a really cool part because the film in and of itself was really powerful. But then afterwards, the audience got to engage. Like, That's they great. got to ask questions and hear from not just a filmmaker and a journalist, but from 
there was a an internal mes medicine resident from MGH, wow. Diana Applewhite, who was so There was so a panel cool. discussion. Exactly. Okay. Um, there were, um, I think some of the people in the film were on the panel, so some community members um, and family members of the people who were lost, um, as well as like policy advocates. Um, so it was, a, it was a really great, diverse panel, yeah. um, diverse perspectives, and people asked great questions. And I think the kind of overwhelming narrative was like, what can we do? You know, sure. what can I, as a journalist, do? What can this person, as a parent who's lost someone, do? Like, where can we show up? How can we make an impact? Yeah. Um, and you know, the city is doing talk, quite yeah. a bit in terms yes. of just you know expanding their programs and services mm -hmm. from like the Narcan training and, oh, yeah. and the Needle Give Back program. Um, and obviously, it's not an exclusive way mm -hmm. to solve the mm -hmm. issue at all. But clearly, the city is seeing the mm -hmm. value in yeah. And trying think, to staff that. Yes, absolutely. That's definitely happening. Um, one one kind of narrative that they shared was that it w it's really important as kind of at the state level, they're engaging in conversations about safe injection sites, about mm -hmm. methadone clinics, about creative ways to keep people from dying. You know right. what I mean? Because whether we like it or not, this is happening. Yep. You know, it's it's here. So you know, yes. Great. The the best situation would be to have people to not do the drugs, but people right. are doing the drugs. So, so how do we save these people who yeah. want to live? So, a lot of the activists on the panel said, you know, don't engage in the not in my backyard mentality. Like, if if the city is considering a methadone clinic in your neighborhood, please don't speak against it. Like, that's kind of what they were saying. Is like it it doesn't bring all these violent people. It brings people who want to get better. Right. You know, it, it's so to it's a stepping stone. Exactly. Yeah. So please, you know, that's something you can do to support. Like advocate for these. Um, you know, show up at you know hearings at the state house because um, a lot of this is going on at the state level, not Got necessarily it. at the municipal level. And then that'll dictate down to how the local exactly. municipalities um, handle it. Yeah. So that's kind of where that's at. Wow. But the, the screening itself was amazing. Um, it was really, really powerful. I spoke to a lot of people there, and you know, people learned a lot, and you know, it was very emotional. Um, but it was an overall really great event. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the city of Somerville has has done quite a bit, like I said, and they also funded a a, a grant documentary, grant funded documentary that we had produced and are going to be releasing soon. Awesome. Um, a little bit different of the perspective of looking at um, individuals and and groups who have been at the bottom and have also been able to rise above and have been able to be rehabilitated. Mm -hmm. So a little bit more on the positive, hopeful side of what is a person who has been like who has been an addict. What do they look like? How do they function back in a society? So it's a little bit different, but um, all these different efforts from a journalistic standpoint, I think from a municipal, um, you know, resource, you know, program wise, I think. It'll never, I don't think it'll ever fully <laughs> resolve it, but I think everything helps, right? We so, start somewhere. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so the youth voting age, mm -hmm. last time you were in here, we, we mentioned um, just kind of the, the different meetings that were coming up and that were happening. Yep. Um, from those meetings that did happen, what was the participation looking like sure. in terms of the community turnout? Sure. Um, yeah, so that, those hearings, there were two public hearings um, in early April. Um, we reported on both of them. Um, the there was one at three p.m. and one at six p.m. expressly for the fact that they wanted students to be able to come right. to the one at three. It was great. Um, yeah, so <laughs> students were definitely more represented at the three p.m. one. Um, but there were, you know, there were definitely both. Um, on on one hand, you know, obviously a lot of the students were speaking in support of this, but there were also other community activists and just residents who were speaking in support of this for sure. Um, a lot of it had to do with. Um, brain development, how at that point um, your brain is developed, your like um, cognitive functions that like help you with that kind of cold reason are, are already developed at that point. Oh, so so it doesn't very really scientific. Very scientific, yeah. It doesn't really make any difference to like wait till 18, really. Um, and a lot of the, honestly, I mean, these students are um, frankly more politically engaged than many adults. So that's kind of what their argument was as well. You know, we're on the streets, in the neighborhoods, in the schools, we see what's going on. A lot of you don't see what's going on. We should be able to vote in the municipal elections. Like this is impacting us. Um, and another thing 
I think to acknowledge in that is that this is currently being considered at the state level as well. That the, it's called the Empower Act, which would essentially um, mean that cities don't have to do it themselves, that it would just mandate statewide that um, people could vote in municipal elections. So it's right. not for state elections, it's for right. municipal elections. Um, but I think kind of the arguments against um, are, you know, understandably, it's, it's complicated because people's feeling is that, sure, okay, brain development, but we just like raised the drinking age, we just raised the mm -hmm. age of gambling, you know right. what I mean? So if you can't gamble until you're 21, if you can't drink until you're 21, um, you know, you're dra you can be drafted at 18, right? There's all these conversations, but you can get your permit to drive at 16. The age of consent is 16 in Massachusetts. Like, what is, what are we talking about? Right. I mean, when are you an adult? Because it's, mm. which definitely makes the conversation a little bit more complicated. So I think that is um, what the council is grappling with right now is I know a lot of them are kind of generally in support of it, but it's a, it's a good question. Yeah. You know what I mean, how do we measure adulthood? Yeah. Does it have to do with brain development? Does it have to do with political engagement? How do you measure that? Is sure. it possible to make kind of a blanket allowance or law? So it's a complicated Very complex. Issue. Yeah, um, but they're they're taking it up, you know. Um, it is kind of important to acknowledge that this was attempted in Cambridge and failed okay. a few years ago. Um, so there isn't much precedent, um, but there are a few municipalities in Maryland that have okay. successfully done this and have seen an incredible increase in like not just voter turnout but um, continued engagement as they age. Wow. Um, so. They're, so they're anticipated, yeah. like, when they're looking to maybe have a response on this, the council counselors? Um, at, the, at this time, I believe they're going to continue discussion okay. on this because the last time it was heard was a couple weeks ago at the public hearing. So I think the next step for them is to, as a council, um, deliberate on this issue. In terms of upcoming events, so I, there's, you know, I'm a big fan of the Somerville Open Studios. That is happening in a couple of weeks here, um, as well as a bunch of things around the Sustainable mm -hmm. theme. Um, what do we have going on? Oh my god, so many things. <laughs> I couldn't list it all off for you, but um, I know there's an amazing like fashion show on May 2nd at the Armory. Um, there are gallery openings all over the city, so definitely like go down to Artist Asylum and like Somerville Media Center and all these other places. <laughs> um, for Sustainable, um, oh my gosh, there are so many opportunities to learn more. There's um, cookbook clubs, there are um, urban gardening opportunities, a lot of things with the, the library. library. Yeah. Um, if you have kids, there are a lot of like story times and things that have to do with like the climate, which I just think is so adorable because like get them young. Yeah. I, mean, I love <laughs> no, it. No, it's true. Yeah. Um, there's a lot going on. Um, I know that one of the things I think is really cool is I think on Sunday the 28th, April 28th, um, there's kind of an informal citywide tour okay. where um, residents can sign up to be on the map and then um, people can just walk around and are welcomed into the homes to see like what some of our residents have been doing to make their homes energy efficient. Mm, that's cool. Uh, all the different ways they're being created. Practical. Whether it's, yeah, exactly, whether it's they're upcycling things or they've installed solar panels, but kind of like all over the, the spectrum of, because it's expensive often to like make these changes. So right. kind of see how people have saved for it, what they've been doing. That's great. Um, so it's, it's definitely informal. There's not like a, you know, everyone leaves from here at a certain right. time. Um, but, but I think it's, Really yeah, cool, so. that's yeah, awesome. That was just a couple things. Cool. <laughs> and then also there's another thing that we're doing here. Hey, yeah, Eric, tell me all about that. <laughs> <laughs> so shameless plug. Um, so Vox Pop is uh, a new endeavor that Central Media Center is is um, embarking on with uh, FRIT, the Federal Realty Investment Trust, who manages Assembly Row. Mm -hmm. And they basically, um, you know, we had conversations about how can we activate a vacant storefront space they had over there, and we submitted a proposal, and basically we are doing a pop-up arts, community, and media uh, studio over there. I know, from May 9th until the end of August. So May Amazing. 9th is our, is our grand opening, and we'll also be having a comedy show um, that evening. So 6 p.m. we're going to do a ribbon cutting, and then 7 p.m. we'll be um, doing our comedy show. And everyone is welcome that night and really throughout the entire summer. I mean, we'll have some limited hours, and mm -hmm. all the information is on our website. Um, but we'll be having comedy shows, storytelling, mm -hmm. um, community arts, and uh, live like vinyl DJs, um, to podcasts, um, to 
just all sorts of like movie nights. We're doing some classic movie nights. We're also doing um, some SCAD TV binge uh, events where we're going to curate kind of some some best of our of our member nice. production so for people to enjoy mm -hmm. and just to really kind of showcase um, our members who are involved here to curate a really cool experience for, for the greater Somerville community mm -hmm. but also to just engage our community partners who we been working with and new partners who mm -hmm. want to come over and host um, some events so on our website somervillemedia.org forward slash vox pop Box Boom, box. we're going to have... Journal will we'll be there. And several Journal will be there <laughs> on the grand opening. Yes. Um, but we're just really excited to have this kind of like this energy around, mm -hmm. whoa, a new space and we're outfitting it and we're kind of creating this whole creative yeah. vibe in there mm -hmm. and we hope to increase visibility and outreach and just let people know we're here. To me, like, that is such a perfect summer opportunity. Like, it, it makes total sense yeah. that it's, like, May through August. It's I a love great that. pilot. Yes. And, and, you know, what happens afterwards, we don't know. But for now, we're just trying to make it the best experience possible for, for everyone. So, awesome. so yeah, May 9th, uh, 6 p.m. Um, and then, so, to, to kind of wrap it up here, I know, you know, you're always seeking different ways for community mm -hmm. input and community engagement. And something that we were talking about was, just I think representation and the diversity of representation on all different levels of diversity uh, and leadership in the city of Somerville. Um, what what are you seeking in terms of this question, yeah. and also how can the community help guide you and shape and shape that inquiry? Sure. Um, so I, I recently wrote a report kind of analyzing elected leadership from two specific perspectives, um, race and gender. Um, but kind of in writing that, I realized that there are you know, a lot of other important factors to analyze this from. Um, I kind of tweeted it out, and one person responded that it might be interesting to analyze it from the point of like homeowners versus renters and how that could inform our leadership's perspective. Um, and I think I'm also interested in what the community thinks about looking at elected leadership versus appointed leadership, you know, because right. we have some elected leadership, the city council, the school committee, the mayor, but a lot of our city leadership is actually appointed by the mayor. Like commissions. Exactly, such, yeah. exactly. So who are they, you know what I mean? Right. And what what is their demographic and what matters in terms of who makes them up? Right. So I guess, you know, I would, I want to ask the city or hear from, you know, the residents about whether you feel represented. If you do, why? And if you don't, why? You know, what factors are important to you in feeling represented? What do your elected or appointed leaders need to have or have experienced in order to accurately represent you? Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm definitely looking at making it an ongoing series. Okay. Um, no kind of hard deadline. Um, I'd like to look at it over the course of the summer. Great. Um, but yeah, and that's I'd just love a matter feedback. of emailing you. Emailing me, tweeting at me. All the different ways. Direct messaging me. <laughs> I will find it. I am at the end of everything. Um, so yes, thank you, Erica. Awesome. Well, you're doing great work and um, it's always a pleasure to have you down here in the studio. Um, and that wraps up yeah. this segment of the Summerville Journal News Round. And again, thank you for, for tuning in and please share and support all the different things in Somerville and we'll see you next time.